Invest Africa, proudly brought to you by KPMG. Thank you for joining us on this special edition of Invest Africa. I'm Nozi Pombanjo. Now, information communication technologies are playing a significant role in transforming African economies. ICTs have contributed on Africa's GDP, increasing on average at 5% a year over the past decade. And joining me in studio now to discuss innovation in ICT in Africa is Yorana Sabi. He is the Chief Executive Officer of Digital Solutions Group. Frank Rizzo, Partner for Information Technology Advisory this at KPMG and in our Cape Town studios we are joined by Chase Kappers, CEO of Wise Talk. Gentlemen, welcome and thank you so much uh, for making the time to join us. Frank, let's start off with you laying uh, the, the landscape out for us. Where do you see the biggest opportunities for ICT development in Africa right now? Okay, so uh, towards the end of last year we actually commissioned some, some research across the continent to understand how much investment is actually going into all the pillars of IC and T. And um, good to see that a lot of countries are actually putting a lot of um, uh, funds into this. And um, it's exploding. Um, nice to see all the internet connectivity that's coming to the continent. Challenge to get that through into the continent. Mm. But um, lots of startups, lots of investment in that area. So yes, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's booming. You know, it certainly sounds that the opportunities are there from what Frank has just described for us. but challenges as well as he makes that statement there. Where do you see the biggest bottlenecks for Africa right now? Cost of access is still expensive. I think that there's a lot of um, uh, opportunity to improve. We've got one of the highest costs in the world in terms of uh, bandwidth and uh, data. Uh, we also have uh, the ability to improve on our smartphone penetration. We are near 24%. I yeah. think the whole internet connectivity is at 16% around the continent. So well, it's growing fast and it's exciting and it's a great opportunity, but it's still a relatively uh, small penetration. Yeah, so we, we're seeing a penetration opportunity. What's stopping us from tapping into it? I think affordability, mm -hmm. um, uh, as much as there's a need for it, and, and the internet has changed everything, it has an impact on education, on health, on, on financial services, I think that the uh, affordability of using mobile uh, mm. internet or, or using internet from a fixed line perspective, yeah. which is not really relevant to Africa, is, uh, is quite expensive. Chase, let's uh, bring the conversation to you in Cape Town. We've had the gentleman here laying out the opportunities as well as the, the broad challenges on the African continent. But let's Let's be solutions orientated. Let's look at those specific markets in Africa where you think this is low hanging fruits for us to see real ICT revolutions. Where should we be looking? Well, I think even locally as South Africa, you know, there are tremendous opportunities that present themselves from a startup perspective here. You know, we've got an established economy, but Nigeria, Uganda, there are a number of other countries, including Kenya, that have very high, uh, you know, uh, rates of acceleration in terms of ICT and startup revolution. But I have to agree with Yaron. I think the, the, the mere fact that our costs today are so expensive in terms of data transfer on mobile telephony is, is highly prohibitive. Uh, and, and will slow things down in terms of uh, uh, projections unless these costs come down remarkably, as well as access to the data uh, in terms of fast data over, mm. the, over the coming years. Well, he's spoken about cost and he's put the elephant in the room right in the center of the room, right. and that is this uh, storm that we're seeing brewing on the South African front in terms of the proposed consolidation in the telco space. Mm. What, are, what would this mean for ICT development? Well, in general in a market, if there's consolidation, then obviously it means less comp competition uh, for, for, um, in the market and therefore customers potentially have less choice. Um, across the continent, yes, there probably is going to be some, some consolidation. Is it needed? Probably as we increase uh, the scope of the players that are there. And there, there's a customer benefit in my mind, mm. because you, by consolidating, you, you're creating more availability of connectivity and bandwidth, and hopefully costs come down as well. But it's not just about costs, it's about access. Yeah. And access to that bandwidth is what's key. Otherwise, all these dreams that we have of creating these startups and initiatives, um, they're not going to work unless you've got that bandwidth running. I definitely want us to talk about startups, but maybe staying on this issue of cost, Iran, and in particular, um, the, the, the talk of sharing infrastructure and how that is a potential uh, possibility to bring down the cost. Do we have a regulatory environment that allows for those kinds of mergers and acquisition activity to take place? Most certainly, and I think sharing infrastructure is very positive. We don't need additional footprint if the infrastructure already exists, but there's definitely an opportunity for niche telco players 
such as MVNOs or uh, the host operator uh, having wholesale agreements with multiple channel partners that will serve niche markets within the market. Mm -hmm. so Let's take a step back. MVNOs, Mobile Virgin Network Operators. I'm quite certain I'm not the only one who doesn't know what that means. Unpack that for us and, and, and in particular, what's the relevance of them entering the market? How does this change the game? I think it's a, a very positive step. Uh, we've seen a, a, a lot of the uh, resellers of, of uh, mobile uh, getting a margin squeeze because as the infrastructure costs for new services uh, increase, um, there's a need to, for the mobile network operators to reinvest. Uh, what MVNOs do is actually use the current infrastructure, so it's a virtual network operator. They don't make use of new infrastructure, uh, and, they've, and they create uh, unique services that service niche markets. Let's take financial services, for example. A bank might become an MVNO. They already resell airtime at the moment. Mm. It makes sense for them to extend their services as a brand extension into the telco space because it gives them additional customer insight, it lets them get to know their customers better, and they can bundle the financial services with mobile, which is really a huge trend in Africa. Case, is that the answer? Do you agree with this uh, perspective being put here in Johannesburg that MVNOs are potentially game-changing players in the industry? Yeah, I think absolutely. I mean, you know, one other consideration is around where we are with our Wi-Fi infrastructure in, in South Africa and the rest of Africa. You know, if you're in, uh, you know, the United States or you're in Europe, you'll get, you'll get areas where you've got free Wi-Fi throughout your, throughout your time in cities. Uh, and those are things whether they're free or not, but are not largely available uh, in many centers of South Africa. So while we've got the mobile telephony side in terms of 3G connectivity, we also have to look at what opportunities can present themselves for Wi-Fi distribution through the major cities uh, and even rural areas of our country in the coming years. And in the midst of all of that, Frank, we also need to be thinking about a conducive environment for tech startups. Yep. Do we have a culture? that uh, sees private equity investors in particular gravitating towards tech startups? So I think that culture is starting to, to take shape across the continent. Um, in, in, in our research we saw that there's a number of silicon savannas as they're called being uh, formed across the continent. So modeled on the sort of Silicon Valley concept mm. where you bring sort of academia, you bring technology partners, you bring funding, um, access to professional services all in one place and entrepreneurs. And they come through and they say, well, how do I take my idea to the next level? Um, it's early days, but I'm really encouraged to see that there's a number of these across Africa. There's certainly in Kenya, in Nigeria, in Ghana. Yeah. South Africa has a number of these as well. Um, do they need to be sort of more regulated? My view is not. I think we should be pushing those even more. And nice to see governments across the continent also putting investment and drive mm. into these areas. So a number of uh, tech startups uh, in, 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 in various parts of the continent, uh, you're on some proposals for some consolidation there for, to be more attractive to potential investors. Do you think that that's a, that's a feasible argument? Yeah, I think uh, in South Africa, for example, we've got regional initiatives rather than national initiatives. I think the bigger the bulk, uh, the more attractive it is for the entrepreneur. I think it's great to have regional offices, but if uh, all of the different uh, environments like Josie Hub and Innovation Hub in Pretoria had to work closer together, mm. I think it'll be a better service, a better consolidated service to startup entrepreneurs that mm. uh, will serve them better. Yeah. Okay, so we, we, we're talking about tech startups, but from more from the, the perspective now of how do we improve the attractiveness uh, from an investor perspective. Uh, point of view, but let's look at the conversation from the other side of the spectrum. What should, how should tech startups be positioning themselves so that they're able to attract that uh, venture capital or those angel investors looking for a small uh, star startup that has the potential to be something absolutely phenomenal, to be the next Google? So I think what's happening and certainly what we've seen even with our business over the last uh, 24 months is that the movements, particularly in Stellenbosch, which is now through uh, the University of Stellenbosch, created the Launch Lab, which is really around how uh, people in a startup environment or entrepreneurs with tech ideas can get together in, a, in the same place and they can uh, go and present to angels over, you know, on, on given days. And that kind of thing is definitely accelerating. We're seeing a lot more of that in Cape Town. Uh, particularly over the last you know, 18 to 24 months. But to be absolutely truthful, South Africa as a country uh, has, has a very poor record of venture capital. Um, you know, if you compare it to the more established markets of the United States and Europe, venture capital, by virtue of its word uh, in South Africa, is virtually non-existent. And unless you have a great network and unless you are 
I have contacts with angels. Um, it's probably very difficult to get something off the ground here uh, with seed capital. Before we talk, and, and from a government perspective, yes. sorry. No, do go ahead. From a government perspective, what's the view there, Fez? Well, I think you know the IDC do have some kind of plans in place where you get kind of tax rebates over periods of times, but you only get tax rebates when you're, once your company is profitable. So it doesn't really help you in your startup phase. Um, I think government could certainly do a lot more in terms of providing seed capital or even getting involved in some of these launch labs. You know, as your honor said, if you look at the, the innovation hub that is in Gauteng, you know, very successful uh, and, and you have access there as a, as a founder member of a startup to access angel capital. But as far as I know, there's no access to government funds mm. from that perspective in terms of uh, in terms of seed capital. Frank, you're nodding. I mean, mm. he did talk about uh, tax incentives. We did hear Pravin mm. Gordon talking about venture capital tax breaks, but doesn't seem to be enough. So I, I agree with Case that I think it's in the last 12 to 18 months we've seen a change. Um, and even from a, a government point of view, certainly if we talk from a South Africa perspective, there is more uh, focus on this. So the IDC is putting more funding into this from, from what I know. And um, quite happy to engage with startups and look at uh, real, real seed capital funding. Um, so I think that the willingness is there. It's maybe it goes back to culture. I think something that we mentioned earlier. We're, we're just not in that same venture capital uh, mindset that perhaps the US has, mm. but it's changing. That's what How I'm do we seeing. break the culture? I think it's about uh, celebrating our successes. There's a lot of great South African entrepreneurs that have done really, really well. Mm. I think uh, some of them, like Mark Shuttleworth, for example, have reinvested back into the South African entrepreneur environment. Um, I think that we need to uh, educate. Uh, at universities, uh, we need to maybe create some public-private partnerships because government might have a willingness mm. but uh, doesn't necessarily have the follow-through. I think also from a foreign direct investment uh, perspective, uh, we need to make South Africa or Africa a far more attractive market for foreign direct investors. What happens with uh, a lot of the mature markets is you'll notice that there's foreign direct investment that is very sustainable. Um, where I think in South Africa it's very volatile and the fluctuation of our currency has a big impact and the exit strategy for the investor mm. through uh, an IPO on the JSE or any other African market is quite limited where an IPO in the US or, or in the UK market uh, is a lot more attractive. Of course that Alibaba IPO is something worth noting but uh, on that note of exit <laughs> strategies we're going to take a short break <laughs> but when we turn we're going to be taking a look at how emerging technologies will bridge the technology gap for Africa. See you in two minutes. Welcome back. You're still watching Invest Africa. Remember that we do value your suggestions and your feedback. So send us an email that's investafrica at abn360.com or interact with us on Twitter. The hashtag is hashtag investafrica or you can follow us at CNBC Africa or follow myself at Nozi Pombanjo. Still with me, my guest, Sirana Sabi, CEO of Digital Solutions Group, Frank Gritzo, partner for Information Technology Advisory at KPMG, and Clay Scapper, CEO of Wise Talk, who joins us from our Cape Town studio. Chase, let's come to Cape Town first. Uh, just before we went to the went to break, we were talking about the the opportunities around uh, exit strategies and, in particular, IPOs in in a in in the South African financial markets. I mean, we, if we say that South Africa is far from uh, the developed markets, I mean, what are we saying about Africa, where the the, uh, the the exit strategies there must be even slimmer? How then do we continue to attract investors if we if um, financial markets are just so poorly developed? Look, I think from, uh, you know, from any tech startup perspective, there has to be some kind of exit strategy in, in, in a given time frame, you know. And that time frame can include sales to local South African business, to local African businesses. But if you've got something that really has a potential of global appeal, or you've got something that can perhaps own a segment of the market on a continent, um, you know, I think there are opportunities. And, and I think that you know, th there are a number of transactions uh, that take place constantly around uh, European uh, conglomerates that are buying South African businesses because they want to own a segment of the African market. Mm. And I think that's a real opportunity. I think, 
you know, the people in, in Europe and, and the United States are now starting to realize actually this is a sleeping giant. Mm. Uh, at the moment, our GDP uh, as a continent is around two trillion US dollars. But if you look at every kind of report that comes out, this, this continent is going to grow rapidly. And, and in conjunction with the, the faster bandwidth that's coming down through the east and west coasts of the country through fiber, we're going to see an explosion in ICT. And, and you know, there's some really, really smart ideas that are being developed by African people, which, which do have uh, global appeal. But if they don't have global appeal, you know, you look at M-Pesa and you look at a couple of other, you know, the, 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 um, you know, a couple of other products that have been launched in the ICT sector in Africa mm. that have been very, very successful and have had buyouts, you know. Mm. So it's, it's a question of having a product that has appeal, I guess, you know, and somebody yeah. will, will want to acquire you in time. Frank, um, in PESA, that's been put on the table. We talk about this poster child from Kenya from time to time. Why have we been able to replicate the in PESA model with as much success in other markets? Okay, so first I just want to get uh, on what Hayes is saying. What I'm very excited about is, is some, some African solutions to African problems. And there is a regional view of this, right? So you, you don't have to necessarily take your stuff and globalize it to mm. be successful. We have some unique challenges on this continent, and there's some really interesting ideas that are starting to form to address those and Impez is one of them. You know, uh, lack of access to banking and, and payment systems and everybody's got a phone, how can we use that phone to, to facilitate payments and transfers? And that's why that thing has just grown and mushroomed. You ask why it hasn't been successful in other countries, I guess it's a combination of factors. Um, the, I mean, government intervention, uh, regulatory environments, being, there, being able to facilitate that. Um, in, a, in a more established financial services market, it becomes more difficult to do that because there's more regulation of necessity because of the bigger volumes. Um, but that could be uh, obstacles and, and uh, hurdles to, to jump over. Yeah. So th there's that. There's also, if there's an established banking infrastructure already, as there is in South Africa, then it can be seen as another channel. Yeah. What's the differentiator? What's the value add from using that? And I think that's where people have to be quite smart to say, well, yes, I'm trying to solve a problem, but how am I going to make this specific and, and create value for the use of, of that particular technology? Two things that I'm hearing from that particular analysis, changing the face of banking on the continent, but also year on, this must have implications for remittances because now MPS is enabling the movement of money across borders. Is this a, a positive development for that particular space, which traditionally has been dominated by very few players? Absolutely. I think that... Uh, uh, the ease of flow of money in Africa is very, very necessary. You need to move cash out of the economy. Cash is quite expensive to manage. Uh, it's quite dangerous. Uh, we've got very cr high crime statistics across the mm. continent because it's primarily a cash-driven uh, economy. And I believe that uh, with the evolution of where mobile money and mobile money transfer across borders makes it a lot of easy for, for migrant workers. Uh, in South Africa especially, we have a lot of people that uh, have family still mm. uh, in Zimbabwe or Malawi, and they need to transfer money back to them. It makes it so much easier easier for them to work in this country but then transfer the money across. Certain countries in Africa with such a low GDP or such a constraint or and, and reliance on export to be able to make their currency valuable that I think this, the evolution of uh, African trade would be very, very positive mm. for the uh, economy in Africa. And uh, if we could get an Afro uh, like the Euro <laughs> or get uh, some kind of a currency that's common and makes it easy. So for example in Malawi you have to wait for the tobacco auction before you can actually get uh, foreign money outside of the country because there isn't uh, you know foreign currency until the tobacco auction which happens once a year around yes. August or September so it makes it quite difficult unless we uh, simplify it and as, as Frank said and, and Hayes you know mm. African solutions for African problems. Hayes let's go back and let's hop on this uh, new theme that's taken over the show African solutions for African problems and in particular let's talk about whether ICT has uh, stepped up to the game in terms of meeting some of the development challenges that we have on the continent look I think you know I can only speak on behalf of, of what our business has done I mean we're, we're providing a, a specific solution for African problems um, and and I think that one thing which we, which I have to say is that you know our business uh, and as your business develops world-class products you know and we as South Africans as was said earlier need to celebrate the successes of what we're actually able to achieve because as South Africans with South African coders, we are building world-class technology. And we should be celebrating that more. It should be in the press more. It should be, 
you know, it should be shouted from the rooftops actually. And the more that that happens and the more exposure South African startups get in terms of, you know, the risk that the guys are undertaking, but also the sheer skills base that we have as a nation uh, needs to be celebrated. You know, we are highly entrepreneurial as a culture. But we have some really gifted people, some really mm. skilled coders, and these are things we, we should actually celebrate much more frequently than what happens currently. Take that to the sort of African level, and the, the same applies if not more. I mean, there's such talent and skill in a number of the African countries that are just looking for an outlet, and technology enables that. Um, but you need to have the connectivity, the speeds need to be there. So certainly my colleagues in Nigeria and um, in Kenya, so the, di the, the different coasts, the, the ideas and the initiatives that are coming up there are incredible. But they just need to be nurtured, have an environment where those things can But how flourish. do we replicate then? I mean, we spoke about Silicon Savannah mm. earlier on. And again, we have a, a, a pocket of excellence on the continent. But we've got such a huge, massive continent. Why can't we bring these to scale and, and, and replicate? Well, you've got to start somewhere, I guess. But it's a combination of all the factors we've spoken about. Mm. So funding and funding that, that needs to just ramp up across the continent. Infrastructure, yes, while it's there and, and the basic form is there, the speed needs mm. to increase and cost. Yaron, interesting stat that I picked up that uh, more Africans have access to mobile phones than have access to clean drinking water. Wow. Now, for me, that's, you know, two opposite ends of the spectrum, which is very, very problematic. And I want to bring back the conversation to leveraging off ICT for developmental goals. Are we doing enough? Is the government doing enough? And is business doing enough to actually try and bridge these gaps? I think there's a huge opportunity there for end government, for end health for mobile learning and education and uh, the mobile phone has certainly got the potential to, to reach it. I don't believe we're maximizing the potential. There's some great solutions mm. that are available to monitor water, uh, to enhance uh, electricity and, and uh, you know the whole trend globally of going towards a smarter home. Unfortunately we have a much more basic need in Africa often uh, to the bulk of the population is to provide basic services as you mentioned you know clean water and electricity. If we could just get electricity to the bulk of the continent. I think it's improving and it's positive, but I think a lot more can be done. We about talk a lot, ab a lot about um, M Health in particular and, and these paperless hospitals. Do we have an example where we see this? Is there a country that's leading and that we can say, you know, in this particular country, they've certainly got the model right. Let's talk about how we replicate that model now. Yeah, so going with the theme of African problems, African solutions, malaria seems to be uh, a problem on the continent. And I've been involved with the Belinda Gates. Um, um, Bill Gates and Marinda Gates oh, Foundation. Oh, that's a good one, the Belinda yeah, Gates. The, the Belinda Gates, <laughs> I'll just combine the two, absolutely. So um, I've been working with them and Nando's and Standard Bank and a lot of big corporates in South Africa got behind uh, MTN um, around dealing with malaria as an issue on the continent. And uh, part of the problem was distributing nets because that's a, a just an, a, an easy solution to be able to mm. uh, prevent malaria. But another big issue was education and mobile mm. learning. And, and we created a mobile learning program across the continent that people could become more aware of malaria. And, and I think that this talks to uh, one area of M Health. Um, I heard last night from a colleague of mine who works for, for Samsung that uh, there's in, uh, kind of like uh, injecting tools that allow you to inject once only because there's such desperation for equipment and needles that the needles are used over and over again again and therefore get contaminated and disease actually spreads. So, you know, we have unique issues in Africa that we need to deal with. I think technology is certainly there and mm. we can learn a lot from what's happening globally, but we've got to um, act local and understand the local uh, dilemmas. Okay, so we've just heard uh, Yaron uh, punting all of his clients uh, that <laughs> he works with, all of these uh, companies, but let's look at the government side of this. What is it that we need to unlock uh, ICT so that it can meet, uh, it can serve development targets more. Is it a p question of uh, policy? Is it a question of uh, a slice of the national budget? Is it a question of regulation? What does government, government need to do to make this work? So I think, you know, there have been a, a couple of hot points which have been raised over the course of this interview, but I, I think primarily you know, there's a will from government, uh, whether it gets to execute it all the time is a question, but it has a massive task on its hands. It has a housing issue to deal with, electricity, water, um, but also amongst all, and health, but amongst all of that is education. You know, now if we had to allow or create uh, Wi-Fi networks throughout our country where schools, even in rural areas, could connect to the internet, uh, and, you know, there are instances where Wikipedia uh, will allow down, uh, and MTN, I think, are doing a deal now that you'll get free downloads onto Wikipedia through an MTN network. 
Uh, you look at the Chromebooks that Google are building, which are you know sub hundred, hundred and twenty dollar notebooks. Um, if those get distributed and guys have access to internet and you wrap that with education, you know that's where you're going to see some real change happening and and very quickly in my opinion. Some final comments from you, uh, Frank. I mean we've heard uh, some of the examples of M Health and uh, e education in particular, but where do you see the continent going in terms of its the opportunities that lie there for um, ICT? And this is where we started the show. Maybe let's close it on that note. Okay. So to me, um, it creates the opportunity to to leapfrog certain technologies, and I think Mpesa is a great example of that, where you don't have to wait for a formal bank system to be fully in place and mobile channels etc suddenly with the advent of the phone you are able to do what people in, in uh, developed economies have been doing for years but just on a different platform so I think across Africa we have a, an opportunity to leapfrog things that we don't have to now do and dig things into the ground because we've got different technology and that investment needs could be channeled in different ways so it creates a massive opportunity for us African technology solutions to African problems. That's the theme that dominated the show today. Thank you so much uh, for making the time to join us. Thank you to all our guests once again. And Bruce Whitfield is up next as he unpacks the latest news from South Africa's economy on Tonight with Bruce. Until next time, it's goodbye and thank you for joining us.